Here we go. Are you ready, everybody? Continuing on through the book of Genesis. If you go to YouTube and type your name in, yes. your full name, it pulls up those videos. Oh, well. Say that again for me, would you? If you go to YouTube and type in your full name, yep. it pulls up your videos. Oh, wow, fantastic. And I just discovered that an awful lot of you might be re repetitious, but who cares, you know. Some of my messages are actually, they're online. Mm -hmm. If you, yeah. on, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe it. There were so many mm -hmm. still up there, yeah. you know. But I always remember Martin Lloyd-Jones, you know, when, you remember, you heard of him, of course, the famous John, where are you, Presbyterian, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the man who spoke about the second blessing. Well, Martin Lloyd-Jones, you know, was going to teach somewhere, and he said there was a, a recording machine, and he said, oh, no, no, don't want that, because if, so, if you do that, somebody might have listened to my message when I go to the next town. <laughs> but he didn't know. He, he was before the age of technology. And anyway, I'm going to tell you something. It's the more we hear something, right? It's not repetition. It's deeping, sinking deeper into us the more we hear the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, would you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3 as we continue today through the Bible. Now, last week or last time, we had the beginning of many things. We had the beginning, you do remember, of the universe. The beginning of the life forms within the universe. The beginning of man. The beginning of families. The beginning of sin. The beginning that we talked about, we were going to be coming to. The beginning of sin, culture, society. We didn't have this the last time we talked about it. Society, industry, agriculture. And of course, most importantly, God's redemptive plan. Uh, that we would see unfold. And it's so important. And that's why we're going right back to Genesis. To begin at the beginning and see how it all started. Is that Genesis, remember last time? Genesis means beginning. And so, today we're coming to the beginning of sin in chapter 3. Uh, God, you know, created everything. And everything, the beginning of everything in the book of Genesis. Except God. He was there at the beginning. Remember John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So Satan comes along, and what's he doing here? He's questioning the Word of God. Have you got that? He's questioning the Word of God. Don't you know that goes on today? We go out here and we start telling people about the Bible or something. What? <laughs> you got to really write that. You really believe there's a devil? You really believe there's hell? You know, I'm sounding like Tad now when he's doing his voices. <laughs> but, you know, you really believe, you really, do you really believe that? questioning the word of God. So what I want you to know is the beginning of everything, the beginning of the questioning of God's word, but not just the beginning. Also to look, it says here, he was more cunning than any beast of the field. Some commentators say that that word cunning is actually like he was beautiful, that he was really attractive, handsome, magnificent looking. And we know for a fact, as we'll see in verse 14 later on, that it looks very like that he wasn't slithering around on the ground like a snake at that time. How'd he come? Well, I don't know how he was, because it doesn't tell us, so I can't tell you that. But I can tell you one thing. He questioned the Word of God. But he doesn't only question the Word of God. Read on. Look at this. Verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. So here we have a questioning, little alliteration for you. A question, oh, not quite alliteration, questioning. A qu now alliteration, a questioning, a challenging, and a contradicting. Challenging, contradicting the word of God. And it goes on today. When I first came to know the Lord, and I won't drift off into testimonies and things at any great length today because we want to go through these two chapters, but I will tell you something. I encountered people in my hometown. Hold on a minute. The Bible, that's an ancient book. How do you know? I don't believe. Questioning, challenging, and I'm sure you got it too. Many of you, you know here that we can see that for beginning, 
but also to <laughs> the beginning of something else. The beginning of the first, or rather, the first lie ever told. The beginning of lies from the prince of liars. Satan said, you shall not surely die. The Bible isn't true. You don't believe that. That's all garbage. That's all rubbish. Prince of liars. Verse 5. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you'll be like God's knowing good and evil. What's he telling them? He's telling them, stay away from the word. Of, stay away. God, God's word. That God knows that if you, <laughs> you know, if you go the way he's telling you to go, he's going to control you and he's going to keep something really good back from you. You will, he knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like him. You'll be justice. So he's challenging the justice of God and he's challenging the fairness of God. And today, you know, we know this, you know. And it's marvelous that we have, and I said it last week, someone even as young as Delana here, because, and the reason why I mentioned Delana again is because for younger people, you know, Delana, and it's true, isn't it, out there, but not only for younger people, for all of us, there's the temptation of drugs, of sex, of alcohol, of all kinds of things, abuse of some of these things, and, 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 and the destruction that comes. The devil said, come on, lighten up, you know. You can go and have relations with people. Where is the big deal? Hey, where's the big deal? Look at the disease in the world, AIDS, all the frightful things that are happening. But it doesn't tell you about that. So he's holding something back from you, Satan is saying. Saying that to us today. There's our application. So when the woman, verse 6, saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now, as you're looking here at the scripture that says, good for food, pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make you wise, listen to 1 John 2.15. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For he that has the love of the world in his heart has not the love of the Father. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life is of the world and is not of the Father, but is of the world. So Old Testament, New Testament connection, brothers and sisters. Your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God. And a tree is good for food. It's pleasant to the eye and desirable to make you wise. There's the pride. There's the satisfaction to the flesh. All the things that if you go the route of the world will take you. But it's of the world and it is destructive. So the woman saw that it was good to the eye, and she saw that it was desirable and would make you wise, and she went for it, and she ate, and along came Adam. She gave it to him, and he ate as well. Now we're coming, brothers and sisters, in our study of Genesis, to what is known as the fall. This is the fall of man here in the garden. The beginning, if you like, of sin, and the beginning of the body awareness. The beginning of body awareness, the beginning of sin. Why? Because let me tell you, an inversion took place at this moment. Okay, Pastor, what do you mean, John Henry? What do you mean an inversion took place? <coughs> when man was created, we learned last week, just like God. God said, let us make man in our image and likeness. Now, we said primarily we're talking about the spiritual aspect when we're talking about free will and we're talking about love and the ability to have love and have free choice etc etc but also you think of God as a superior trinity right we talked about that last week we saw the hint of the trinity even in Genesis 1 now God had said let us make man in our image and likeness father son and holy spirit he created man in his image and likeness spirit soul and body now, again, a reference for you on that would be Paul in Thessalonians 5.23. He says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord 
Jesus Christ. So we are created an inferior trinity, inferior only to God, who is the superior trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he made men an inferior trinity, inferior only to God. But notice what's uppermost. Spirit, soul, and body. The spirit, the mind, and the body. Spirit uppermost, because that spirit was in a beautiful union, communion, and harmony with God. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, spirit. And we learn of Adam and Eve walking in the cool of the day in the garden. In a beautiful communion with God, spirit uppermost. Well, now an inversion takes place because this is the fall. And what happens at this happening here in Genesis? Well, what happens is they go for what's good for the eye, what's good for food, what's good for the flesh, the pride of life. And the spirit dies and the body appetite comes uppermost. What can I eat? What can I drink? What can I wear? Oh, I made it. Fig leaves. Cover up. All of this is the beginning, of course, of sin. And we see the inversion taking place and man's awareness and consciousness, of course, now of his body. And Paul, of course, tells us in Ephesians 2, he says, In the ways you formerly walked according to the course of this world and according to, listen, listen, the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is working in the children of disobedience. In fact, the Bible tells us that we came into this world, if you like, we are by nature children of wrath. Why? Because of the fall. Now, where does that take us to immediately for us to have clarification on the Old Testament, New Testament link up and how this all fits together? Well, you jump right up to John's gospel. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, oh, you know it all and you're a teacher of the Jews, huh? Nicodemus, you must be born again. He said, what? I must be born again. What do you mean I must be born again? Nicodemus, if you are going to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. You were born. He said, how can I be born again? I, I was born out of my mother's womb. No. He said, you were born once of the flesh. The fall. Children of wrath. Now you must be born again of the spirit. And that's why there's so many of us here, I think perhaps for all of us here, and maybe for some listening. That is why, what in blazes, what in tarnation happened when we came to know Christ? I mentioned it on Wednesday night when something reminded me of my own experience of coming to know Christ by reading the Bible, my dad's old Bible. What happened? I can't, I can't really tell you. You can't really. Something happened. You changed. You became completely different. You know what happened? I didn't realize it back then, but an inversion took place. What? Yes. Another inversion. Where when you are born of the Spirit, the Spirit comes back uppermost. Now it's in a beautiful union, communion, and harmony with God again. And the body and the mind are very much secondary or down the line. And your spirit is alive to the things of God. That's why so many people in America... So many people in Germany, so many people in Ireland, they haven't a clue. We go back there, some of us from Europe, and we go back and we're, what's going on with these people? They don't get it. No, because they were steeped in religion for years. Germany, North Germany, Protestant, Southern Germany, Bavaria, Catholic, Ireland, North Protestant, South Catholic, and they were steeped in it. And in fact, they killed each other. They fought wars. There were terrible things went on in the name of religion. Because the spirit wasn't uppermost. Religion. Uh, religiosity. But not the real deal. We have to be born again of the spirit. You know, Romans says that they that are of the flesh do mind fleshly things. And they that are of the spirit do mind spiritual things. And listen, it says, in, this is a very important one. It says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man cannot understand, cannot understand the things of the spirit neither can he know them for they are spiritually discerned and in Galatians the mind of the flesh is sin and death but the mind of the spirit is life joy and peace the natural man cannot understand so I think we are sometimes when we go to neighbors or friends or people we want to talk to I drove around the sandbar this morning I came here already at a, uh, you know running up on time because I wanted to spend time just drive around and pray and I drove all around the sandbar all 
uh, it takes, uh, how long, I know it takes about an hour for me to cycle it, but whatever. But I drove around and I prayed, God, you know, to, to touch these people, you know. And, and, and but they must be touched that they come alive in the spirit. Because we can be talking to them forever about the Bible. A great book, and the Bible's got it all, you should read the Bible. Well, of course we do, and even if we don't say the other or anything about the spiritual to them, we're praying that as they read it, that's what happened for me, that they come to know the spirit comes and speaks to them, of course. But, but it's very important to know here, you see, the natural man doesn't have a clue, really, about what we're talking about here. So Genesis is the beginning of sin and death. Fellowship lost, but fellowship provided at another, by another tree. Lost at the tree in the garden, but provided by another tree. The tree of Calvary, the cross, that Jesus died upon. And it is through that that the Spirit comes alive again, by our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so, brothers and sisters, and in fact, you know, in your own time, if you get a chance, I read it all the time when I'm doing funerals, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and in all the funerals I've done, I've always used something, some from this. In, the, in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he speaks about the natural body and the spiritual body. Let me see if I can cut to the chase here so that we don't spend too long over it. But it says here, the first man, yes, the first man, Adam, became a living being. This is 1 Corinthians. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Who's the last Adam? Jesus. First man, Adam, a living being. The last man, Adam, a life-giving spirit. And I, I haven't time to, to delve into it for our time's sake today, but I'll tell you, as you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you will discover that he speaks about, you know, first comes the natural body. And then the spiritual body. But you can't enter heaven in the corruptible natural body. It has to be the new born again spirit body that enters the kingdom of heaven. Where there will be no more death, no more sorrow. And by the way, just for the record, we may get to it today. That's where the tree of life is today. In the kingdom of heaven. And one day we'll be, because of the tree of life, the cross of Calvary, we'll be around that tree that was in the garden one day in the kingdom of heaven so he says here, you know, <laughs> uh, sin, again, sin separates us from God. I just made a note of that, and it certainly does. The beginning now of the effects of sin. What's the, what's the beginning of the effects of sin, John Henry? They sewed fig leaves together. What are they trying to do? They're trying to cover up. Try to cover. Did you ever notice that with religious people? It happened a lot in Ireland. I saw very sincere people. and I'm, I'm, God may very well work through this in the course of time with them. But they go off doing all kinds of things to try to cover they're sinful, so they'll go and do a missionary trip. They'll go and do something else. Because I'm doing this because... Uh, yeah. No, no, no. We don't have to do anything. It's all been done by what Christ did for us on Calvary's cross. And they're sewing fig leaves together because they're trying to cover up and they're trying to make amends for what they did. Sometimes people... I had a guy in Costa Mesa. He built half the houses in Huntington Beach. He's a very, very wealthy man. And I had him come to the study on Thursday mornings. I met him, I was out in a boat, out near Catalina Island, and we were all out, they invited me. I actually happened to live in an area that was extremely wealthy. Now you say, wow, John, that's very nice. Wow, boy, were you on, <laughs> were you on that prosperity theology stuff? No, no, no. What happened was, um, there was a woman coming to my Bible study, and uh, I didn't earn much money at all. You know, back then, even when I started out, it got, as it grew over the years in Calvary, it got better. But, this woman had a beautiful house right down on, in Newport Beach, you know. And she came to the study, and when she died, she said to him, she, I did her funeral in her house. You know, that was about it. Nothing more. Goodbye to her and everything. And a couple of months later, her son, who was there, came to me and he said, you know, I'm renting out the house. Would you be interested? And I said, well, you know what? You're, you're barking up the wrong tree. I, I, I couldn't afford to rent your garage, you know. <laughs> so he said, no, no, no. What are you paying right now? So I told him, oh man, <laughs> could you pay 300 more? So I said to Hillary, what do you think? Because she's better at that kind of thing than me. I've got two of my money. <laughs> so she said, uh, I, I think we could, you know. So I said, we'll have a go at it anyway. If that's okay with you. He said, fine. And we wound up living there. All the wealthiest people in Newport Beach. <laughs> so this guy started coming to the study. I, I should go out in a boat with them, you know, and fishing with them and stuff like that. So I went out with these guys and they were all there. They were all, you know, they all had fun with me. One was a very 
a lawyer with a big big practice, another guy with uh, building houses, another guy, oh, amazing, amazing guys, all very successful. Uh, but one guy on the boat, a builder, built all the houses in Newport Beach, he said to me, I want to know, I, I want to know what's going on with you. You're kind of different. And I thought, oh, <laughs> <laughs> they've said that to me before. You know, well, he said, you don't kind of fit the mold of the regular pastor. You know, there's something about you that's different. I want to know. So I told him. And so he wound up giving his life to Jesus Christ, you know. Mm. And uh, about a year later, he got cancer. Uh -huh. He started coming to the Thursday morning Bible study in Costa Mesa. And he loved it. First weeks he was coming, he was saying, this is great. I love being here. Now, what can I do? Can I give, can I give to something? Can I, I don't want your money. I don't want anything. I would never take money from people. I said, keep your money. I don't want it. I'm not looking for money. Uh, oh, really? Well, can I? Well, I said, you can. We had a trust. We had a fund that, you know, people couldn't come to the study or their car broke down. And wealthy people put money into that. I had, I had like a lot of money that one particular time. I couldn't touch it myself, but I could dole it out to those who had need of it. It was all watched over, of course, in the proper way. But, you know, um, he thought, he said to me, because I, I want to, you know, I, I've lived a very bad life, John Henry. And I, I want to make up for it now. So how, how can I? Oh, man. I said, you, you know what? You know, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. Nothing I can do? Nothing. Because he's done it all. Amen. And so beautiful, beautiful message there, God. I've, I've deliberated I shouldn't because we haven't got too much time. But it's a little indication here of the fig leaves are trying to cover up, trying to make up for it, etc., 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 etc. It's not by works of righteousness that the Bible says that you're saved, but by our faith in Jesus Christ, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam said to his wife, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called Adam and said to him, Where are you? Now there's one thing I would like to say. As you look at that, he said, Where are you? I used to, I envisaged this for years. I had watched too many movies back in Ireland with people like Charleston Heston, you know, and I envisaged God saying, you know, Adam, where are you? <laughs> Actually, not poor old Charleston Heston, he had a lovely voice. Really mean spirit, really going to pounce on you. Adam, where are you? You sinner, you wretch. Yes, Lord. I envisaged you like that my whole life. I really did. I don't anymore. I don't anymore. I have a different relationship with my dad right now. I know he looked down and he said, Adam, Adam, where are you? Mm. You know, as a parent to a child, right. I did a little bit too much of, Eric, where are you? <laughs> Sorry, Lord. <laughs> Carl, get over here. Gary, sit down there. Adam, mm. where are you? Now, maybe somebody here, why not? Maybe somebody listening right now. You're hearing God say to you, Johnny, where are you? What's going on? It's not, it's not, it's not the cry of an angry, vengeful ogre, somebody coming after you. It's the cry of a heartbroken father. And that's why, you see, it's God comes after us, right? I think I told you this before, I'll tell it quickly, and that is that I remember speaking in a Presbyterian church in Northern Ireland. I didn't know that sitting in the congregation with Dr. Fleming, former moderator, sitting right there. And he came up afterwards. I said, well, just about, I didn't know you were there. I wouldn't have, I'd have been immobilized. I'd have been unable to speak, you know. Dr. Fleming was highly regarded, you know, wrote books and everything. And so he was very, he said, John Henry, your message thrilled my heart. There's just one little thing I'd like you to note. I said, sure, I'm always open. Of course, I was about two years a Christian. He said, John Henry, um, you didn't find God. God found you. <gasps> Man, and boy, oh boy, of course, it was a life lesson, wasn't it? See, I've never forgotten that. God, where are you, Johnny? What are you doing? He said to me back in 1987 on the verge of suicide, having lost everything, terribly angry person. Involved in all kinds of stuff. Could have been locked up. Just crazy life. Ira, back in the day. <coughs> Where are you, Johnny? On that night, in 1987, when Hillary came to bed that night, and I said to her, would you be willing to read the Bible with me? 
and we started to read the Bible and everything was different. Nobody giving me a big pep talk, no massive, wonderful pastor with a great sermon, that, and it can happen that way too. And that's why I had to speak out of it. I'd spoken up. Sharon, we were chatting back and forth all of a sudden because we were so thrilled by what was going on in this revival. You mentioned, you know, the, the, the Bible. I thought that's exactly what happened for me. And so, at any rate, what's going on here? The one thing I've got to move on, don't I? Listen, he's saying here, he says, Adam, where are you? Does, oh yeah, does that mean that God didn't know where he was? Where are you? Where did you? Where you go? Where did Adam go? Okay, where are I? Come out, wherever you are. <laughs> Are you behind that tree or that bush? <laughs> did God not know where Adam was? No. Well, of course he did. God knows everything. <laughs> so is God in need of information? No, no, no. God was not in need of information. Adam was in need of confession. Mm -hmm. I touched on that for just a brief moment today because there might be somebody sitting here listening right now and you're in need of confession. <clears throat> huh. I ain't pointing any fingers at you. There'd be too many coming back at me, so don't worry. <laughs> well, I am saying this. Conviction's important in our Bible study. And if you need to repent or you need to confess or you need to come before the Lord and say, I'm sorry, make sure, seguro, más importante en el mundo. Make sure it's the most important thing in the whole world that that's first place. Because remember, two men went up to the temple to pray and one was a sinner and the other was a, uh, one was a publican and the other was a sinner and, 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 and the, the other was, was a Pharisee, sorry, and the other one was the public and the sinner. And who was heard? The one who went up and said, sorry. When he went up with all of his righteousness, could it be, brothers and sisters, that we could go to Bible study? We could talk about the things that, oh, excuse me, pardone. We could do Bible studies. <laughs> we could be pastors. We could be elders. We could be deacons. We could be people in the church. We could be people saying, we're serving the Lord. We go to everything that's on. We're very, and we haven't really sought forgiveness. Listen, you want to be free today? You want to be free today? Confess, admit, confess, repent, turn away, metanoia in Greek, turn away and rejoice. David said in, what was it? Oh my gosh, what sound was it? 32. My bones were wasting away. I had no rest day and night till I confessed my sin to the Lord. So let's move on. Confession, little important word there, maybe for somebody here today. So anyway, let's see what. God, man is in need of confession. There we are. Thank you, Lord. Man is in need of confession. Let's see what he does. Verse 12. Then the man said, the woman who you... God said they, those who have cell phones should really turn them off before they come to the Bible study. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, whoever it was, I love you. Um, then, the, <laughs> then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Now, what have we got going on here? The first excuse. Have you got that? There was an old pastor in Costa Mesa. Well, you know what he used to say? Gang, you're What's that? Oh, they're blaming somebody else. Oh, I think my blame is going on. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I'm staying out of this one. Um, Romain used to say in Costa Mesa, he, he was a little guy. He was as wide as he was tall, and he had been a sergeant in the United States Marines. And boy, he was tough. And he controlled all the pastors. And he just was, you know, it was like a military operation for years in Costa Mesa, military style. <laughs> oh boy, you couldn't be a minute late. You couldn't. That's why I'm free now. Woo! I can float around South Carolina, free as a bird. You, everything was really tight. And he used to say, if anybody came to him and said, well, why did you do that? Oh, well, 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 yeah, but, uh, well, I, 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 I agree with you there, but yeah, but, he would say, yeah, but, yeah, but, don't mind those yeah, buts. I don't want any more yeah, buts. Anybody who makes excuses is good for nothing else. Wow. And he talked a little bit like W.C. Fields, you know. I got to tell you, there's a little bit of fun aside. The lady came into the office one day. Oh, he loved the lady. Sharon, he would have absolutely loved you. You know, and ladies, he would have, he would just, ladies, he was the sweetest pie, man, you know. Men, especially pastors, they were a breed. He was going to annihilate for sure. So at any rate, I got on really well with him. Praise the Lord. I ain't kidding. A little lady came into the office one day and she said, Pastor Romain, how are you? Are you behaving yourself? <laughs> he looked at her and said, tried it once, didn't like it, never tried it again. <laughs> 
He, and I said to him, what's your real name? What is it, Irish man? What is it? <laughs> you remind me of W.C. Fields. <laughs> Are you aware of the fact that he was a drunkard? <laughs> I said, yes, sir, I am. Are you calling me a drunkard? <laughs> oh, no, sir, I like life. <laughs> he was, he really had this. And funny thing, on Thursday morning Bible study, years and years later, after he was dead, guy came to the study. He said to me, John Henry, I got a good one for you. You're always talking about Romaine and his, his, his stories, you know, how tough he was. He said, I had a guy, I was, I was back, you know, he said, 50 years ago. This guy was 80. 50 years ago, I went to a Bible study. And the guy who was leading the Bible study was a guy called Charles Fields. And I got up, and I, first time I ever went there, and Charles Fields, a young man, young enough, and he got up and he said, I'll open tonight with prayer. Our Father in heaven, how be thy name? <laughs> Our Father, he said, that sounds like W.C. Fields. <laughs> Give us a day or daily bread. So I went up to him afterwards, and he said, your name is Fields? You, you sound like W.C. Well, he's my father, you know. He's my father. But I never really met him. I never had anything to do with him. He never came near me. Seemingly he wasn't a good dad. But he was the son of W.C. Fields, <laughs> would you believe it? Came to a Bible study I was doing. But anyway, the interesting thing here, guys, is that he had a good line, really. Excuses. You know, this is all he does is make excuses. The woman you gave me. She gave me of the tree and I ate. Now it is also interesting, isn't it, that he blames the woman. Oh, excuse me, ladies, did you see that? I was doing fine till you gave me her. This is woman you gave me. It's all her fault, not my fault. She's to blame. First, note this, first passing out the buck. He passes the buck. Comes to the woman. The Lord said to the woman, what is it you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. She passes the buck again. So then the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, there you have it, verse 14, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field, on your belly shall you go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. So obviously he wasn't on his belly, back to the beginning of the chapter, whatever form he came in, we don't know. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. What is this all about? Well, first of all, Daniel, we talked about this last week. Remember you said to me, you promised that after you left the Bible study, I told you this would be coming up, and I told you that you should get yourself, if you was any fear of sunburn because the short, <laughs> short hair on the top of your head, you should go immediately to the CVS pharmacy and get yourself a tube of proto-evangelium <laughs> and rub lots of it on. It's very good for sunburn. It sounds like something you'd buy in CV, doesn't it? Proto-evangelium. You know, if you, if you, if you get sunburned. Proto-evangelium. Maybe it'll be a way you'll remember it. I'm not just telling it to be funny. Maybe you'll remember it. Now, what is proto-evangelium? It's a Latin word. Proto means the first. Evangelium. Sound like anything? Evangelizing. Evangelism. Evangel. Telling. Proto. First. First. Telling. First telling of what? The gospel. How? Where? When? Why? Look at what it says. Here he says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Wait a minute. A woman doesn't have a seed. A woman has an egg that's fertilized by the men's seed. Huh? Hold on. Virgin birth. Virgin birth. Mary gave birth to Jesus. The virgin birth of Mary. Your, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He shall bruise your head. Who's your head? He's talking to the serpent, right? Mm -hmm. He shall bruise your head. Who? The seed of the woman. Mm -hmm. Who's the seed of the woman? The virgin born child. Who's the virgin born child? Jesus. Mm -hmm. He shall bruise your head. What does head represent in the Bible? Power, authority. What happens at the cross of Christ and Calvary? The power of who? Satan is broken and his Satan is crushed. You shall bruise his heel. There ain't no doubt about that. Yes, what does that speak of? Jesus on the cross. And when you even think about it, those spikes that went in, I'm not saying it's exactly that, it's just, I'm saying it is exactly Jesus, of course, but how it, the, the very fact that the spike went through his feet, mm -hmm. 
And if you put your feet across like this, they say that's the way they did it, not two separate feet. It will go right through and into the heel and pin you to the cross. Could this be that it's that much detail? So do you get it? First telling of the gospel, because a woman doesn't have a seed, so you have the virgin birth. Let's write down a scripture beside that if you're taking notes. Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, I will give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and you shall name his name Emmanuel, God with us, and he shall be great. A virgin will bring forth a son. The seed of the woman. The virgin. Wow. Powerful stuff going on. Verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrows and your conception. In pain shall you bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Quick comment on this, brothers and sisters. Isn't it amazing the one thing that gives such great joy in life, the coming into the world of life, is now going to come with sorrow and pain, the difficulty of childbirth, the curse that came after the fall. It would have been an easy thing before that. And also to hear the men ruling over the woman before any men get into a high horse situation where, because I saw this in Costa Mesa, I'll touch off it briefly, a guy saying, the Bible says, woman, submit to me. Do you know that the word submit in the Bible is the same word as a military word, which means like, you know, in the military, one salutes and the other gives back the salute. It's the return of the salute. It's giving back what you already got. Woman, submit to the husband. What's she giving back that she got? It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, a love so deep and so complete that he laid down his life for the church. You are to love your wife as Christ loved the church. How do you love the church? Oh, uh, let's see. He died for it. That's the love you're to have for your wife. A love so deep and so complete that you would lay down your life for her. That you put her first. In fact, the Bible says, put her first under God. Now, let me tell you something, brothers. It is a fait accompli, as they say in French. It is an easy done deal that then the woman will give back that love to the husband and will want to love him and have him first place in her life. Because, but if he's not loving her first, it's a two-way street. But notice it begins with the man. If the husband isn't loving his wife supremely as Christ loved the church, she hasn't got anything to give back. She can only give back her own love and her endeavors to love but she hasn't got the love that should be coming from him to her that she gives back. And then there is a natural authority in the Bible, absolutely, where you see, we believe in men pastoring, we believe in, in certain things like that. Some people disagree, I don't fight over all that. But nonetheless, you see that there is an authority. I believe that's an authority spiritually. That Hillary makes most of the decisions in many things, with regard to the boys' education, to life, many, many things. But it's always been there if I really said, I believe we need to go to Canada. I believe we need to stay here. I believe there to support me and be there with me. So it's not a man acting as an author authoritarian, aggressive, <coughs> angry, overpowering figure. No, it's the correct order in the Bible. <clears throat> and of course, we are told we are created equal. All of us as the children of God. Just a particular order that's given. Now, verse 17. Then to Adam he said, Because you heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles shall it bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So here, guys, first of all, now, he was dressing the garden. It wasn't an occupation. It was just a, an enjoyable time taking care of the garden. But now he has to work the garden. He has to work the ground. And thorns and thistles shall it bring forth. I'm not going to deliberate long over it, but when I was out with Benji the other day, my little dog, and he got another one of them stuck in his paw. They're called, what are they called again? They're called... What are they called? Sand spurs. Sand spurs. Spurs. Sand spurs. spurs. Thank you. And <clears throat> so I remember when I first came to the Carolinas, I, when I came to the beach, I went for a walk in a grassy <laughs> patch and Benji was <laughs> covered in them. And it took me hours to get him out. But thorns and thistles. Do you know what a thorn is? It's a not fully developed blossom. Okay. Happened where? <laughs> right here. Right here in Genesis. Thorns and thistles began. The beginning of thorns and thistles. The beginning of weeds. How you, you don't ever have to worry about growing weeds in your garden. They grow everywhere. Thorns and thistles. These spurs are everywhere. But also, too, one thing out of interest here. Thorns 
and, and, and he says here, thorns. Isn't it interesting? What was put on Jesus' head? Thorns. Amen, sister Linda, Lydia. What was put on his head? A crown of thorns. Thorns came about because of the curse. The curse of sin. First sin. He died for all of our sins on Calvary's cross. And a crown of thorns was put on his head. Interesting to take note of that. By the way, when he comes back again, Tad and I can have a discussion afterwards about how that all works out. Pre-millennial, post-millennial, ah-millennial, whatever, right? <laughs> but we're not dealing with that right here anyway. But it's interesting, a crown of thorns we see here. And in Revelation 14, 14, when he comes back again, it will be wearing a golden crown. And he said, dust to dust, you know, again here at the very end there uh, of our scripture, dust to dust, man going back to the dust. We haven't time to deliberate, but I think I've touched on it already when I spoke in about 1 Corinthians 15 and the body first and then the spirit. The body goes to the ground, back to the dust. And Adam, Adam, verse 20, called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Who was she up to this? His name was what? Adam. What's Adam? Ish. Ish, dust. And her name was Isha. He was man, she was woman. Ish, Isha. But he's no longer now saying, hey woman, come here. He's saying, Eve, come here. Now she gets her own name. She's no longer a woman. She's now, a, what does Eve mean? Make a note of this, will you? Eve means living. Affirmation of Genesis 3.15 that we just dealt with. Life to come through Eve. The life-giving spirit. Jesus coming uh, through, you know, through the, the seed of the woman that we just dealt with a moment ago. So Adam and his wife, Adam, for, for also Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. Again, I won't deliberate terribly long over it. Because it's really easy to understand. The fig leaves are gone now. Where Someone said, I love this. Where did the fig leaves go? I don't know. I guess they blew away. <laughs> but the fig leaves are gone now. And he makes tunics. He makes, he makes clothes for them. How does he make the clothes for them? Well, an animal has to die. In other words, to skin the animal. and have the stuff to make the clothes. Well, here's the deal. This is the beginning again. The beginning, of course, of the story of redemption. The blood being shed. <clears throat> the blood of the animal to cover them, to cover their sin, because now they're naked. And Jesus, his covering over us. Now there's one thing very important here. Adam, some people say, where's Adam? Did Adam and Eve go to heaven? Well, look at this. He says here that Adam had a choice, one commentator said, and I love it. A dead animal to skin, a dead animal skin to cover him. It was bloody, it was weird. The fig leaves had been doing a fine job now he's given the by God a covering to cover him and he accepts the covering. Wow. Heaven. Wow. Same for us. We have the same choice. Do we accept the covering of Jesus Christ? And if we do, by grace we're saved through faith in Jesus Christ alone, we have everlasting life. Verse 22. <laughs> then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was fought, taken. And he drove out the man and he placed the cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, the angel, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Quick comment on this. I all my life read this and thought it was a protection, or thought it was a, a punishment. But it wasn't just punishment. When you read the scripture closely, he put him out, why? It says he put him out of the garden so that the man uh, placed the cherubim there, every which would behold the man had become like one of us, no good and evil, now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life. He had to get him out of there. Because if man took up the tree of life, he would have lived forever in his fallen state. So it was actually a protection for the man. And remember I told you earlier, the tree of life, we'll, we'll see it one day. Note Revelation 2.7. To him that overcomes, I will grant to be with me in my kingdom. And he shall eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. 
Chapter 4, very quickly, we won't deliberate long over it at all. Adam knew his wife, she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I've acquired a man, I've, I've acquired a man from the Lord. Now, again here, uh, you know, Cain was born, you know, God had promised the seed of the woman, you know, uh, would, be, would produce the, 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 the one who would crush the serpent's head, and Eve most likely thought, she says here, uh, she, I have acquired a man from the Lord. She probably, probably thought this was the guy. This was the one who was going to crush the serpent's head that had deceived her. But she was to be disappointed, of course. Then she bore again, and at this time, his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of the time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of the flocks and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. What's the difference between Cain's offering and Abel's offering? Very simple. It's, you see it very clear. His, uh, one was an offering of, well, actually, Spurgeon, good old Baptist commentary. Spurgeon says, uh, Hebrews 14, Hebrews 11, 14 is our answer here. By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, because his offering was of faith. So, you see, Nothing can be done in the works of the flesh. Already back in Genesis we're learning that. Because it's all going to point us to Jesus. His finished work on Calvary's cross. When Jesus said to tell us die. It's over. It's done. It's accomplished. The price is paid. It's done. And so here we see now. You know sadly. Cain is rejected. Because his was not offered by faith. Abel offered his by faith. Abel was believing. So the Lord said to Cain. Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Little application, guys, for a second today. Here's the question. Is there sin at the door? Again, write back, admit, confess, repent, rejoice. We really need to be. I love it. I forget who it was said it, but he said, you know, we ought to be in a mode of constant confession. Do you remember... Kirk, was it? Oh, I think it was Kirk. Kurt, the guy who stood in for Tad here one time, mm -hmm. uh, months ago, yeah. And he was talking about this, and he was talking about rep rep repentance, metanoia. And Kirk said, you know, it was Baptist stuff, and uh, not only Baptist, all denominations. We stand up and say, repent and turn away. And it seems like one great grandiose of business. We should be constantly, all the time, keeping short accounts with God and turning away. Because in the little skirmishes, you study the battles of the Civil War, you know, Gettysburg would have fallen if it hadn't been for the little round top in Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. It's the little skirmishes. If they are not victories, not victory at the little skirmishes, the big battles, you will fail. So again here, very clearly, guys, important <coughs> to note uh, that uh, God here is, had given uh, Cain a second chance, you know, Offering him a second chance. If you do right, will I not accept you? Maybe you need to after the study. Maybe I need to. You know, the Catholics go into a little box and they confess to a priest and we scoff at it. Then right, We're not into that because we believe we can go straight to Jesus. But do we? Uno momento. Ein moment. Do we? Or do we just scoff at what they do and we never go? We're not going to a little closet or go alone with the Lord somewhere and say, wait a minute. What have I done that displeased you, Lord? Did nothing block the blessings that you have for me? Now, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, the Cain rose up against his Abel, his brother, and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, oh, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now, you know what, you take a few minutes with this. I was about to actually soar through to the end here and finish right in good time with you, but I know I delayed a little bit at the beginning, forgive me. But I really think you need to hear this. I just was really blessed by this, and I was going to leave it out if I didn't have time, and I don't have time probably, but I'm going to share it with you because I think it brought a great blessing to me. I've told you, as I'm going through this Bible for the fifth time, there are things arising new to me all the time. And in actual fact, Lydia and Greg, it was because of you, really, that I deliberated over this. Because I read many of the commentators, and some of them, several of them were in agreement with this, but one of my favorites, uh, Matthew Poole, you know, from the 17th century, a British 17th century uh, uh, theologian, Matthew Poole, and among others, was in agreement with this. 
And look at that scripture. It's going to take us a few extra minutes, so bear with me. But look at it, because I think, I think you'll like it. I think it's interesting. And I'd never seen it before. He says here, the voice of your brother's blood. No, plural. The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The voice of, why? Why is that? Well, you know, along with others, Poole says that the rabbis believed that when you kill one person, you kill the world. What do you mean, John Henry? Well, all of his or her offspring that would have come forth from his loins, his children, his children's children, and so on and so on and so on. And so that's why it's plural. Now there are others who make comments like the word for blood is used in different ways to different and different types of bloodshed and different types. It may be that too. I'm, I'm not saying this is 100%, but I really like Paul and I really like the other commentators. Oh, listen, that all, that all back this up as well. So it isn't like a, a pyramid standing on one point. There were a lot of people backing this up. Now, uh, also the rabbis also say that if you save the life of one man, you save the world. Where do you see this best? Well, that was a couple of times in Israel with Chuck Smith, and he didn't ever go there. He never took the groups there, but I used to always, I always was fascinated. I would always make my way to the Yad Vashem Museum, the museum to the Holocaust that the Jews have there in Jerusalem. And as you enter and you walk in, you walk along a tree-lined avenue as you enter Yad Vashem. And in actual fact, Jürgen, my friend, German friend, was actually with me. We went two together. He was with us on the tour. A really good friend of mine. He's actually a movie director in Hollywood, believe it or not. And so he was with me, and we walked into the Yad Vashem, and we spotted, of course, the tree to Oskar Schindler. A lot of people don't know, by the way, a lot of German people that actually stood up against the Kreisau Circle, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, many. They're hardly ever talked about, you know. But even in the Yad Vashem Museum, these people are called righteous Gentiles, those who stand because they saved a life, and the one Oskar Schindler, every life that Oskar saved, it saved the whole family of them. There's one beautiful story told, and again, this is where I'm taking the few minutes. I, I think you'll find it interesting, and I promise you we'll go quickly to the end, but I think you'll find this interesting because it's a beautiful story. There was a story told, you know, that at a certain concentration camp in Germany uh, called Auschwitz, Auschwitz in Polish, there, there was an escape, you know, and uh, the prisoners uh, escaped, and uh, they were all captured except one, you know, and they were still searching for the one. And it wasn't Hoss, it wasn't the commandant of Auschwitz, it was his deputy who actually walked up and down between the lines of the men that were lined in the, in, the, in the yard. And he walked up and down between the lines and he just said, you, you, you. And he pulled out ten men that were to be put into the starvation bunker, that they would die in the bunker of starvation with nothing to eat. And he came to one man, Francis Gaudjanitsek of Poland, and he said to him, you. And he turned and he said, Please, I have a wife and children. Please don't kill me. And a bespectacled, uh, round spectacled man, as skinny as could be, stepped out from the line, name of Father Maximilian Kolbe, a Catholic priest. And he stepped out and he said, may I speak? And the commandant said, what does this Polish pig want? And he said, I have no children. I have no wife. Can I die in this man's place? The commandant said, sure. They were whisked off into a bunker underground where they were left with nothing to eat or drink. And within 10 days, they were all dead, except Maximilian Kolbe, the priest. He was still alive. And they had to give him phenol in the vein to kill him. Well, after the war, some of the SS men that were present, not just one, more than one, recorded that what happened was amazing that they could hear from the bunker, Kolbe leading them in songs of praise and worship. Wow. That they sang up to the days before they died in the bunker. Well, that's not the end of the story, because I want to take you all the way to 1980, to standing in St. Peter's Square in Rome. And I think it was John Paul, or one of the Pope, like that famous Pope, you know. And he was there, honoring, honoring a man called Father Maximilian Kolbe. And standing in front of him in St. Peter's Square was Maximilian Kolbe. His children, his children's children, and his children's children's children, the grand, great-grandchildren, 
standing in front of the Pope. And the Pope said, because of this one man, Maximilian Kolbe, you are all here today. You would not be alive today were it not for Maximilian. But he said, and credit to the Pope in this, he said, but I have news for you. There is one greater who gave his life for all of us. And we are all here because he laid down his life for us. So the rabbis, interesting thought there. So the bloods, have you made a special note of that? But you know what, here's the clincher. That's a lovely story, that's nice stuff, and that's true. But listen, it says, the bloods, the voice of your brother's bloods. What I came across further to that really blew me away. And that is more importantly, with reference to the book of Hebrews that Tad is teaching us on Sunday mornings. Hebrews 12, 24. Write that down. This is linking with Genesis now. Hebrews 12, 24. The author declares concerning Jesus Christ, his blood speaks better things than that of Abel's. I never really got this connection. I taught this five times. This is my fifth time. Listen to me. His blood speaks a better thing than that of Abel's. The blood of Christ speaks of better things. You know, I, we used to have study the Bible in Bible college and this and that. You know, we would have stuff like, you know, linking who is like Christ, uh, Joseph being a type of Christ. I never really thought so much of Abel being a type of Christ. Did you? Is there anybody with your hand up if you really had connected with Abel being a type of Christ? Thank you, uh, Lydia. No. Well, listen to this. First of all, numero uno, quickly. Abel was a shepherd. Jesus, wasn't he? He gave the author of an animal. Jesus Christ was the good shepherd, is the good shepherd. Abel offered a sacrifice that was pleasing to the Father. Jesus Christ pleased his Father by offering himself as a sacrifice on Calvary's cross. Abel was hated by his brothers. Jesus Christ was hated by his brethren and rejected by them. Abel's blood had to be, was spilt, even as Jesus' blood was spilt. Abel's blood cried out. This is all pool, by the way, Lydia. Abel's blood cried out, just as Jesus' blood cried out. Genesis 4.10, Hebrews 12.24. But Abel's blood speaks, the commentator says, of condemnation. Abel, where is your brother? His blood is crying out to me. But Jesus Christ's blood is not for condemnation, but for salvation. A beautiful picture. I hope it's blessed you. I spent the next few minutes with it. I'll bring you to the end now. But always when you look at this and you see blood, you see bloods. Bloods. And anybody who kills someone kills, a genera kills all of the offspring right to the end of time. That it will come to that person. Does that give you a kind of an, a, a, a greater understanding? More of a fear of ever murdering or killing somebody to take someone's life. Wow. Especially with the big murder trial going on over in Walterboro right now that we all can't help but watching. It's in front of everything. Let justice be done. Amen. Amen. God's will be done and that justice will prevail. But anyway, I did deliberate, but I thought you'd like it. I hope, I hope you did. Now, verse uh, 8. We'll get to the end here now. Uh, we, we read that, verse 8. So let's move along here again now. Again, 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 again here. What have you done? He's again, again, quickly. He's not looking to find out what did you do? I, what did you do? I don't know what you did. Tell me what you did. No, he wants him to confess. Well, we dealt with that. So let's move on. And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries, blood's cries from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's, your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day of the, from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond of the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. So protection for Cain. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod. And I promise I'll be finishing very quickly before you all find yourself in the land of Nod. <laughs> I, I, I promise we're coming close to the end. I, I totally promise. Uh, in the land of Nod, <laughs> on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she, convinced, she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city, and called the name of the city after his son Enoch. 
Now, quick, quick, quick one for you, because this is a very often asked question. Where did Cain get his wife? Huh? Where did Cain? You get Bible answer men on the radio and that. They say, this is the most oft asked question. Where did Cain get his wife? Well, what you have to understand is the genealogical records are not at all complete. And Adam and Eve obviously had lots of sons and daughters. Well, then he'd have had to marry a relative. Yes. He, he could have married a cousin. He could have married a relative. He could have married a sister. Because one commentator said, and I love it, you know, the genealogical pool wasn't contaminated like it is today. So he could easily have found, and again, you have to understand that Adam lived, by the way, 930 when Adam died. This is all happening when he was 120, 130 years of age. Many sons and daughters. So it's no problem at all in Cain finding a wife and marrying her. You can dig into that in greater depth yourself, but I think the other story was more important than just trying to figure that out. We, we do know that the genealogical records are not correct. And by the way, we're going to see some names come up in a minute, like this name, Anosh here. Don't fuss too much about this line even, because they're all going to be wiped out in the flood. Here we go. Verse 17. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived of more Anosh. That's what I said. And he built a city. And the name of the city was after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Erad. To Erad was born Mahujael. The Mahujael was born Methusael. And the Methusael was born Lamech. Now, by the way, very quickly, a little later on, we, we told you the most important line is the line through Seth, right? Adam and Eve, Cain, not Cain, Adam and Eve, Seth, Enos, Cain, and Malil, Yarach, Hanach, Methusael, Lamech, Noah. All of those names, you're going to find some of these names appearing again. Not the same person. These are all wiped out in the flood. It'll be a new list of names. But some very, like for instance, I'll give you an example there. You all heard of Methuselah, right? Mm -hmm. But here you have a guy called Mahu, uh, Methusael. It's slightly different, just so you know that. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Adah, the name of the other was Zillah. And Adah bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who played the harp and the flute. So livestock, the beginning of farming, the harp and the flute, the beginning of Irish music, no, sorry, the beginning of music, the beginning of musical instruments. I do like the harp and the flute, though, I have to admit. Um, Irish science symbol for Ireland is the harp. Uh, verse 21, here you see the beginning of musical instruments. Verse 22, and for Zilla, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. One quick note. It wasn't until the antediluvian age, that's antediluvian, before the flood, all this is taking place. Before the flood, Israel, the Jews, had iron and bronze and were smelting. Do you know that it wasn't until the time of Solomon? It disappeared after the flood. And right up to the time of Solomon, they didn't have iron. And when the Philistinians, when the Philistines were coming against them, with their iron chariots, the Jews were at a big disadvantage. So it disappeared for many years. That's just an interesting aside. We're at the end. Final verse. Then Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy times, seventy times sevenfold well here you have again the beginning if you like now he's saying wait a minute Cain killed Abel but that was deliberate and now I've killed but I did it because uh, self-defense so I should be forgiven 70 times 7 isn't that interesting first of all isn't it interesting that he says 70 times 7 <laughs> you ever heard that before Jesus mm -hmm. forgive 70 times 7 but also to just as we're talking about beginnings, the beginning of the judicial system, law, the beginning of the courts and law and a system, the judicial system begins. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. Now again, write that one down, because I remember what I told you, as we come to the close, Adam and Eve, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Malalil, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, all the way down from Noah to Nahor, Thar, Abraham, all the way down from Abraham, all the way down to David, 
all the way from David, all the way down to Jesus. And there is the line, 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations, all taking place. And so this is the line we will be following. We're getting to this line of Seth next week. Very important. We won't, we'll be moving on with that. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. And then be, men began to call on the name of the Lord. And I think it's probably high time we called on the name of the Lord and called our time together to a day to today to a close. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. And we do pray, Lord, that as we have heard you speak to us today through your word, that we would have grown. And you, you told us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we know that you are the word and you are with us. So Lord, would you speak your word deep into our hearts right now? And Lord, not only having heard it, learned, grown, but Lord, we will walk out of this place encouraged and blessed and Lord, desiring to live it, to forgive, to admit, to repent, to rejoice and to be free because of what you have done for us, you alone, on Calvary's cross. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's family said? Amen. 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 God bless you guys. If there's anybody needs prayer, please come on up.